Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, episode 47, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, gear maintenance and storage when you're not out in the woods, not on the trail, just not using your gear in general. So this is going to be more... Uh, if you're going to put your stuff away and maybe leave it for uh, an extended period of time is kind of where I'm going with my side of this. Uh, unfortunately, Ben and I did not have a whole lot of time to discuss like we normally do at the start of this, you know, life and all that good stuff. But I think we were pretty much on the same page and all was going to be well. Uh, wouldn't you agree, Ben? I hope so. <laughs> so for me... Um, I mentioned about a couple points that I want to hit on, but uh, why don't you start with your points, Ben? I'll do our advertising and whatnot, and then we'll get right into this full swing. Yeah, I guess, well, let's just start off with the idea it kind of came from. is You were mentioning, uh, like, sharpening and, and knives and stuff, and I said, you know, like, a good thing to probably talk about is your, your gear maintenance and sharpening knives is part of your gear maintenance. Like, if you have an improperly sharpened tool or, or, or a dull tool, it's not going to perform well, it's not going to do its job. But there's so much more to that. Every time you take a trip, there's all kinds of gear that we take, and it needs to be maintained, it needs to be uh, kept in a clean, ready state uh, so that you can depend on it. If, if your gear isn't well-maintained, it's it's not going to do what it needs to do. It's going to fail potentially earlier, It's or it's not going to perform in the manner that you expect it to. Um, and that's kind of the gist of the of the of why we do the maintenance. Now, how we do the maintenance varies with every piece of equipment. Um, it looks like you may have done the background stuff there now. Raph. Yep, we're all good. I, I've got it down to actually kind of a crazy little science, so it only takes me about ten seconds now. Yeah, yeah, I notice. <laughs> um, no, I do. Like you, you're getting pretty good at this. Um, so. Let's start us talk. Start off a little bit about the knives and and and, and uh, sharp tools. I guess uh, we said sharpening them, and I mean that's definitely a big part of it. Um, and that's something that's kind of an ongoing task. You, you're probably always to some degree dealing with that. Uh, I carry, and and I got to thank uh, fellow uh, Nova Scotia Bushcraft member uh, Greg Mosier. He uh, I think he, you know, he bought me this little tiny ceramic mm -hmm. rod. It fits in my pocket. It's really cool. And that keeps a nice fine edge on, on, on my knives and stuff. The thing is, it's a very fine tool. So it doesn't put, like if you net, nick, dent, really dull, it's going to take forever to put a real good edge back on it. Mm -hmm. But it maintains an awesome edge. Uh, which, when I'm in the field, is generally all I need. I don't expect to, to seriously degrade my tool in a single trip when you get home you might want something a bit bigger i got a little diamond stone it seems pretty smooth but honestly it does go through the material pretty quick i had to go past that i have one of these two-sided rough uh wet stones things like that um and there's i mean i do mostly by eyeball feel but there are much better tools out there maybe robert will talk a bit more about those i don't yeah. <laughs> There's electric ones you can buy that are pretty well automatic. There's and that's uh, coming in the future as well. Yeah. Uh and there's uh just ones that have the, the bevel and you just drag the knife uh, straight through for kinda cheap, small, quick. Uh and they all have their advantage and disadvantage and it really depends on what you want and what you're comfortable with. Uh I'm not really gonna tell you exactly how to sharpen your knives, but well, that's a topic sharpen. for a whole other time, too. We could talk about sharpening just alone. Oh, yeah. But what we could throw out there is the type of knife really does matter. Just something over and above before you start is if you have um, the carbon steel knives, mm -hmm. they're relatively, and correct me if you disagree in the least, and I'm sure you won't, they're relatively quick to corrode. Uh, you really have to keep an eye on them. And as such, they need to be oiled. Uh, and depending on what the handles are made of and stuff, you may have to do treatment there. They're wood. You want to keep them from getting, like if any finish that's on them is, is preserved or oiled. If there's leather in it, you'll, you'll want to potentially prevent it from drying out and cracking. 
So those are some maintenance with knives. Now, I, I really am interested in seeing what you just uh, teased us with because I, I haven't flashed actually, up. <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually <laughs> used one. I've seen them used a couple of times. I know they do an awesome job. But I haven't actually used them. So. What Ben's talking about for anybody that's just joining us on audio and if anybody's watching is uh, I have the opportunity to use one of these Lansky kits and um, this is on Boro, it's not mine, but it, uh, I have used it in the past and like Ben said, it makes a wicked edge and the thing I love about it is uh, anybody can use it. So that's the whole kit there plus I got a couple ceramic stones to go with it. Uh, once again, this episode was kind of going to be around this, but... It went way late, so now there's going to be a review video on that. So I don't want to give too much away on it, because then you wouldn't watch the video. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, the great thing about the Lansky kit is, as long as you've got the time and you don't rush it, anybody can sharpen a knife. And it does give you some basic skills for when you do flip over to uh, a whetstone or something like that. It gets you kind of eyeballing angles, and but you kind of got to do it in reverse. But that'll all be covered on the review. So like Ben said, there's systems like this. There's uh, the whetstone like Ben had, the ceramic rods, uh, those pull-through ones that Ben was talking about. That's that's what I cheap out on and I throw in my bag if I really damage an edge out in the woods. Those will give you a cutting edge quickly, but they don't seem to last, those pull-through sharpeners. But uh, anyway, kind of got off topic there a little bit. The big thing is you got to keep your tools sharp. So not just your knives, but your axes, any cutting edge, if you're going to be using it, storing it, anything, doesn't matter. It should be at least in working condition. So it doesn't have to be blistering razor sharp, even though that's the way I prefer to keep my knives because sharper knives cause less cuts, believe it or not. Um, it should be at least a little bit sharp. It has to be clean. And as Ben said, you may have to oil it uh, and maintain it a little bit that way, especially with the high carbon steel. Even if it's not high carbon steel, if you're going to put it away and it's going to sit on a shelf for any relative extended period of time, a little light coat of oil. And it does not motor oil. Shouldn't say that. <laughs> I mean, it would work, but if you ever use that for eating, you may get a funky taste out of it again. But uh, like, what I like to use is coconut oil, like uh, yeah. extra virgin coconut oil that you get from uh, where did I get mine? Mine's Costco, one of those great big tubs. I use it for a ton of stuff. Uh, I prefer the natural, uncooked, unboiled virgin coconut oil. Basically, they just squeeze the juice out and throw it in a container. And uh, th that's what I prefer, prefer. But there's tongue oil. There's walnut oils. Uh, in a pinch, you can literally use canola oil, but it gets tacky. Uh, I wouldn't use that on leather, but that's a whole other thing. But any kind of oil that's going to seal it from moisture is the important part, I think. Ben, what, would you agree? That is your end goal, trying to prevent it from oxygen and, and moisture from getting to it overly uh, and causing that corrosion, that, that wear. Um, and, and, yeah, it's, it's a pretty simple task, but I think we all fall victim to it. You, you're out on a trip for a couple of days. You get back. Your tools maybe aren't quite as dry and clean as they should be, but you're tired. You're exhausted. You throw your tools down. In your, uh, your camping area, I have quite the uh, big one myself, uh, camping area, not, not that it's organized the way it should be, <laughs> but all my tools come down here. And if I don't deal with it right away, I tend to deal with damage. I'm getting some flashing on my end. What do you mean by flashing? Yeah. The live stream looks okay. Okay. Well, if anyone's noticing anything weird, let us know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like normal technical issues. <laughs> but... Uh, it totally distracted me. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, Squirrel. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, oil to remove oxidization, moisture. You have a large area downstairs. If you don't keep on top of your maintenance, sometimes it causes problems. Yeah, so I got a couple of knives. They're good knives, but they have slight corrosion on them. I had, I had to clean them up, you know, a steel wool or, you know, clean that rust off, oil them up and protect them. They're still good tools, but... The bit of damage that's on them is my fault, lack of maintenance or lack of proper maintenance. And the problem uh, with that is if you get pitting, like surface rust is one thing, you can clean that off. But if the rust stays on there just long enough to start pitting, you can't get pitting out unless you actually take the material off the knife. So yeah. aesthetically it looks bad and it actually creates a weak spot in the tool as well. So a little bit of time, just give it a quick wipe down, clean it off, a little bit of oil to seal it, solves all that. Yeah, oh, for sure. Um, and that's, 
you know, that's your knives, your axes, your saws. All these things are potential. Anything metal really yeah. has the potential to corrode to some degree. So the uh, only thing I'd say on saws, is because you just uh, you struck that point, and if you have teeth on your saw, and this one actually has a little bit of flake in it, but you should clean that out too. Like uh, it's really easy to use your saw and you just kind of give it a quick flick or a tap on a tree, and it's good enough for the time, and you throw it in your bag and back off you go. But once you get home, you should take like uh, I just got one of those dollar store brushes, scrub brushes, and you just kind of give a quick flick through the teeth, and it pulls all that extra wood and stuff out because that wood will actually trap. A little bit of moisture and it'll sit there and it'll hold moisture against the steel and now you're back to that whole corroding thing and you might get a weak tooth and it'll chip off or something like that and i mean this this maintenance stuff does not take a whole lot of time we're talking maybe like to do all your gear an hour after you're done uh minus some of the bigger things that you may have to let dry that we'll talk about later yeah and i have examples of that in my view right now so uh, we've more or less, I mean, we can definitely come back to this, but I think we've covered off your knives and stuff. I think so. Uh, but you mentioned either already or before leather. Yes. So, uh, for my example was the case that my knife is in. So that is, yes. Oh, go ahead. That, that was a similar example that I was going to throw up. I have a couple of knives that are in leather cases. I mean, you have your boots and stuff too, but that's a, that's why it's a good segue from what we just left. Oftentimes, our, our faces, our shields, our, our, our sheaths, whatever you want to call them, are made of leather. And if leather is left, especially if it gets wet and then dries out, it tends to get really dry and crack up. And now it's useless, all but. Uh, and if it's on sealed leather, you run the risk of molding. And I, yes, I have a moldy sheath over there somewhere. They can stay over there. Because <laughs> if anybody hasn't experienced what moldy leather smells like, it is an interesting sour smell that you can't really compare to anything else once it gets going real good. Mine was one of those Garmin knives. Uh, hmm. Not knocking Garmin in, in any way, shape, or form. My fault. Uh, I think what happened to it actually was... The sheath broke anyways, and I just left it in the basement, never did anything with it. And over over time, because I thought maybe I could salvage it someday, I bought a replacement. And over time, it actually started to go green with the mold, and not a lot I wanted to do with it after that. Well, the other thing is a lot of leather sheaths, they use brass rivets and stuff like that. And that will actually create a green corrosion on everything, too, if you don't properly maintain it. Yeah, well, that, the leather holds a natural moisture and stuff, and that that actually corrodes the the brass. And of course, there's there's a reaction between the gra brass and the leather, so it's it, they feed off each other a bit. It's if you keep it oiled and you keep it clean and keep the brass nice and polished, you'll never have that problem. But you do have to maintain. You have to check it every you know, regularly, whatever you're using it before you put it away, when you take it out, make sure it's in good condition. <laughs> Uh, and that gear will last a lot longer. If you're slack, like I have been, I'm sure many people have been, I don't think I'm the only one, <laughs> then, yeah, you're going to have gear that'll go bad. You won't be able to use it anymore. And uh, that's not only potentially costly, but it's an inconvenience. When you think I have all the tools I need for my trip next week, and you go down and you pick them up and, two or three of them are no longer in the shape you need. Now you have to try and replace that before you do the trip, which can hinder the enjoyment of the overall trip and may prevent you from being able to do something you had expected or wanted to do because the equipment you were planning on taking isn't there. And the replacement isn't readily available. Uh, yeah. And I completely agree with you there. I guess kind of bottom line is a short amount of maintenance at the right time, will save you a lot of time fixing mistakes down the road. Are you saying an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of pain? That's the one I'm looking for. Thank you, Ben. I couldn't remember what the actual saying was. <laughs> you could see the old wheels turn and the smoke coming out, could you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's exactly it, though. That is 100% what, what we're saying is taking your time, Doing a little bit of maintenance, it usually doesn't cost you much, if anything, to do maintenance. Uh, 
you know, having a sharpening stone, you can pick these up for anywhere from a couple of dollars to a few hundred, depending on what you want. If you want, like, the full uh, Lansky-style kit, there's better kits than that one out there that can cost three and four hundred dollars. I know we talked about one in the past, me and you. Um, but you don't need the most expensive one. You don't want necessarily the most cheap one, but you do want something that works and something that you're comfortable with. And Spending a few dollars on that gear means that the gear you have will last a lot longer, and you've invested, I assume, most of us have invested quite a bit into the gear that we have. So making that gear last longer and perform better, it's it's just a smart uh, move, and it is going to save you time and uh, money in the long run. Um, so... We've kind of alluded to this. I, I, I guess we should probably throw this up. Uh, my One of my dreadedest, most dreaded things when I go camping is when it rains the day coming home. Uh, yeah. Is that, and doesn't that just suck all the way around? <laughs> yeah. so, so when that happens, you're, you're going to be taking all your gear, wet, soggy gear. You got to shove it in your backpack now. Everything's wet. And you get home and you have to take absolutely everything out and dry it and hang it. I've got clotheslines pulled across my basement all over the place. And I, this weekend, I took a tent out to play with. I had it set up. I was doing some testing. And, of course, it snowed all Sunday night and Sunday. So I ended up taking it in soaking wet. It hung for two days with the de humidifier running and a fan blowing on it before I was ready to put it away. And it was fairly dry when I put it away, but I'm planning on using it this weekend. So it is now put away. It's going to be pulled back out. And then probably next week, it'll be hanging for another two, three days. Uh, and that's the important thing there. Like you said, you had yours hanging in the basement two days, you said? With, two days. With uh, a yeah. dehumidifier and a fan blowing on it. And it was still a little wet. So the important thing is uh, tent, sleeping bag, tarps, anything. Make sure it's 100% dry before you start packing it away, especially if it's going into a small space and you don't have any air moving around it because now you're back to tents do rot. Sleeping bags can rot. They can develop mold. Uh, a lot of other real gross stuff can happen if you throw moisture into any of your gear and then cram it into a small space. Yeah. And, and that's the thing you, you, you don't want. I mean, yes, it can rot. Yes, it can mold. Yes, potentially you can clean the rot and, or the mold off rot. You can't do a ton with. You can replace th small things that rot, I guess. But to get mold off, for instance, I've often used bleach. Well, that degrades the material in itself. So if you took that extra time to dry it, clean it before you put it away, it's much less likely to have mold or rot, and it's going to last you a lot longer. Um, and by when I say it was a little bit damp when I put it away, I think I found like a drop or two of moisture, which I wiped off. I think it's it's 99.99% .99 dry. But that is important. It's, it means you have to hang it up, and you're going to have to move it around. You're going to have to flip it over just to make sure that all sides have had a chance to properly dry before you put it away. Uh, tarps are another fun one when they get wet uh, see i have the advantage at my house i got the sunroom just outside the office here which is all closed yeah. in and it's like 15 by 30 so i got tons of space to dry it but it only works in good weather like right now i yeah. can't hang anything out there and just be frozen right so yeah. take that into account too when you're taking your stuff and when you're going to store it like me uh sometimes i'll wash my tent tarp stuff like that and i don't mean like scrub it i mean take the garden hose give it a spray down because our tarp for instance um, that we used the last time we were out, it developed like a nice layer of woodsy dust pollen something or other on it, you know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. And all that stuff, yeah. uh, it doesn't seem like a big deal at the time, but the more it stays on there and you fold it and it rubs, it just it creates a very fine abrasion and you can actually get some wear and tear on your gear just by not doing the proper maintenance. You know, surprise, surprise. Yeah, and, and a nice damp sponge, and hang it up a little taunt so you can work it, clean most of that off quite well. Yep. Uh, uh, so Chris is here with us, and he just asked, a stuff sack with a moisture absor absorber. Um, in general, 
not a bad idea, but you'd still want everything dry when you put it in there. The moisture absorber would just be for anything you might have missed. Uh, if you're throwing it in there and you know it's a little damp and hoping the moisture absorber would pull the moisture out, I, I'd be skeptical on that one. If it was, especially in a stuff sack that's a closed in spot, you might get something that's tight and the moisture won't pull out of it. Now you're back to the whole rot mold thing. I tend to agree, it's, it's, depending on how tight it is and the type of material you got, moisture's not going to move through it. Tarps are naturally waterproof, hopefully, anyway. So, unless the moisture... I love how you said hopefully, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, it just I, hit me, and I was like, yeah, I really hope it is. <laughs> I, I've seen things that are less waterproof than one would expect. <laughs> okay, I'll go with you on that one. I, I've been behind tarps that when and intense. I've been intense before, and the rain's been hard enough. When it hits, it just comes through in a mist. <laughs> I've never been that bad, but I I've have no? been with the people that have been. Uh, you'll be in a tent, and they'll drag their hand down it or something while it's wet. And if anybody hasn't done this, that's basically breaks the surface tension, and now you have a waterfall of water coming into your tent. Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen it. No. uh... I've been in a couple of pretty hard waterfall, uh, waterfall rain, rainstorms, and uh, generally with like equipment that's a few years older that probably needed to be rewaterproofed anyways. And uh, yeah, sitting there, and, and you, we got these big heavy drops hitting, and they were hitting with force. Right, like when you go, you get you weren't out for long, you were soaked, and when you'd be sitting, and you could feel it just coming through in a mist. Like just it hits and just that not all of it. A long night. Oh, it was miserable. <clears throat> Uh, I got a couple of kitchen tents that were really bad for it. Now, you're not sleeping in those. You're just in there for shelter, and it keeps the hard rain off you. But, yeah, you can feel it. You can see it coming right clean through. It's 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 ridiculous. And if you look at any rain or any, like, tarp, uh, like a nylon-style tarp, not like a rubber one or anything, they have a, a rating, and it's so many millimeters of, of, uh, of uh, water protection, I think it is. Do you know more about this than I would? I do not follow that. Yeah, I think it's basically if you had a column of water that high, so say it's 600 millimeter, then it would actually, that pressure of water, 600 millimeter high, is strong enough to push through that tarp, which means it's not 100% waterproof. It's it's highly water resistant. Uh, yeah. You'd have to. Uh, and just be aware of that, that a lot of the stuff that's, you know, a tarp, like, um, has, has a limitation. And if you're in a hurricane-style winds and heavy, heavy rains, you're probably not going to stay 100% dry. You're going to stay dr much drier than if you were outside. Do not. But, yeah, it's got its limitation. Um, uh, something you mentioned back there was uh, another important thing to do with your tarps, tents, stuff like that is if you do have them out, you clean them off, it's a nice summer day and it's outside drying, once it's dry put new um, water protectant or wa uh, water repellent on it and redo your seams. A little bit of yep. maintenance on that man, makes your night so much nicer when it actually starts to rain and you don't get the mist on your face. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's an important maintenance thing. As, as gear gets older, I mean, you need to know what your material is and what, what's going to work with it and what won't. But there are places you can go to get that kind of information. Uh, I think with still nylon, there's, there may even be a mixture you can make up. It, mm. Do your research on that for sure. But there are things you can do to recode it. Uh, it's just regular, like, nylon tents and stuff, not necessarily silicone-coated ones. There are... Products, Canadian Tire sells a couple of products you spray on, kind of leave it alone. I've even heard people say things like, um, and don't take my 100% word on this, but the uh, stain, it's like a stain guard for like... Scotch you know guard, you Scotch guard will actually give you a certain level of water protection. Uh, there's other products out there that are worth playing with. Uh, there's a product out there, Never Wet. Uh, 3M product. That is actually a lot of fun to play with. Never tried it on um, a tent, unfortunately, because it's a little pricey. But uh, I have used it on, like, uh, bathroom tiles and stuff like that just to screw with people, and it's hilarious. Right. <clears throat> That's a I story for another time. 
seen a guy do a shirt with it, and if they threw ketchup on him, it just slid right off. It wasn't even there. It is neat uh. stuff. Uh, Chris says, silicone caulking plus mineral spirits equals cheap waterproofing. And I agree, providing you do your research on what you're putting it on. Yeah. One, two, yeah, three. Yeah, and that's... Nope. So uh, that's the formula for making silk nylon. Uh, people have done... I've watched people do that with regular nylon sheets, and you make that mixture. It... Getting it right, getting it dry correctly, is they're going to tell you how how good you you get your waterproofing, right? So it's it's an experiment thing. It's yeah, and the old way of doing it, old way, but the the less modern way was, um, I think it was mineral spirits, boiled linseed oil, and iron oxide, and then you'd have to use like an all natural material like cotton or canvas or something like that, heavy as the Dickens. But uh, yeah. that gives you waterproofing as well as some fire resisting. Yeah. And, and there's the limit in your... Uh, so we're talking about maintenance. You have... Uh, Sil Nylon's a fairly common one now. I have a Sil Nylon tarp. I have a few other Sil Nylon products. Uh, very lightweight. Uh, relatively expensive. But, you know, it, it's, it's one real bane to its existence is it's not very fire resistant at all. No. And in fact, a good ember coming off your fire and flicking onto it is pretty well a guaranteed hole. Like it's the fact that most of this stuff is like a ripstock nylon means that the hole usually stays relatively minor and there are kits out there to, to uh, repair them. Uh, Tenacious tape is, <laughs> puts out a product that I've, I've purchased before. There is, uh, a couple of sil nylon repair kits that I believe I have that comes with a little tube of sil nylon, or an so I think a, a, a silicone tube mm. and some nylon seats, and you can make your own little patches. Uh, but if you get your a piece of damage like that, it's a good idea to do that repair quickly before it spreads and becomes a much bigger problem. Or before you get out there and realize you now have a drop coming down right in the middle of your forehead. Because it always three. comes in the worst possible spot. Oh, yeah. One fire ember, you can have a 15 by 15 tarp and it'll find the one spot where your head will be at all times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or it happens to be right above your crotch and you wake up in the morning and you're talking on a video like some YouTuber we know. And he's trying to convince us all that he didn't pee in his sleeping bag that night because it was a drip. From his Sure tarp. it was. I call bull. I think he yeah, beat himself. I, I think so too. I told him that too. He's not on to defend himself here. I don't think so. If he is, he hasn't no. said anything yet. We got Chris and Gary with us. That's it for now. Yeah, Gary knew something, knows who I'm talking about. For sure. <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, so we kind of covered your cutting tools. We covered leather items. Uh, we covered your tents. So the other big one that a lot of people try to, uh, or may, I don't want to say do wrong, but maybe not quite as informed with is their sleep system or their sleep sleeping bag. Um, and I, I see a lot of people, they, their sleep system worked good. Their tent was good. Tarp was good. All that is great. They jump up. They take their bag, they jam it inside the stuff sack, and that's that's it. They go home, they throw it in the closet. <laughs> he heard us. <laughs> He's listening. Um, but anyway, you, uh, you throw it in the stuff sack, you throw the stuff sack in the closet, and that's the last time that you see it until you go back out. Which, if you're going out really frequently, like maybe a day or two in between, not a big deal. But for me, uh, the last time I used my sleeping bag... Well, the orange one that's hanging there was when you and I went out. And uh, yep. I have it hanging upside down. And if you have a, I hate to say this again, but good quality sleeping bag, you kind of want to, how about this? If you have a high investment sleeping bag that you spent a few dollars on, you'll probably want to take care of it so that it's going to take care of you when you need it. So the proper way of storing a sleeping bag is to hang it upside down. Generally on your higher end sleeping bags, more costly sleeping bags, whatever way you want to look at it, they're going to have little whoops. And those little whoops aren't decorative, they're actually for hanging it upside down. And hanging it upside down is going to let air get through it so you don't get mold, it's going to help it dry, but it's also going to keep your loft fluffy. And what that means, 
in simplified terms, is the insulation is going to keep it expanded so it can actually keep you warm. If you stuff that in the sack and leave it there, you're compressing all that insulation in, and eventually the elasticity of that insulation, or whichever way you want to look at it, is going to stop coming back out. Not so bad with down sleeping bags like yours, Ben. Uh, down ha has a little bit more resilience, but like a synthetic sleeping bag like mine, um, after somebody compresses, that stuff just gives up. They say about five years for synthetic, ten years for down. Yeah. Something but like that. Down in itself, like if you leave it compressed for long periods of time, it takes a lot more to get it to loft again. Uh, so it has its own limitations mm -hmm. there. Uh, yes, they crush down really good, but if they're going to be crushed down to their their most compactness, then later on when you go to use it, you're not going to get the full uh, loft to it. Uh, and there's, there's methods you can use to sort of get it back, but the end result is when you when you have it stored, if it's not hanging like you suggested, the other thing you can get is a much larger bag mm. that you can put it in where it's not stuffed, but it's allowed to breathe. Uh, something like a laundry bag that uh, those mesh style ones would be a good example of something that you could do that. You can get them at the dollar store. It doesn't really cost you much. No, and but it's it a good investment. And worst case scenario, if you don't have either of those options, take it out and just kind of fold it like you would a towel and loosely put it on a shelf. That's still the worst of the yeah. better, if that makes any kind of sense. It's still better than putting it in the stuff sack and leaving it under compression. But like Ben was saying, once you get the compression down, at a certain point, it's not coming back. Like, this is one of my first sleeping bags, uh, and it's it's loved. But, I mean, I can almost see through that. You guys probably can't see me, but I can pretty much see the screen through that at this point. And, I mean, I made the rookie mistake. I always stored it in its compression sack. I always left it out to dry, hung it, opened it up, let the air get to it, all that good stuff. But then as soon as I was, it was dry, uh, it just, you know, straight into the sack, into the closet. And that was the last time I thought about it until I needed it again. And it wasn't too many times using it that I noticed it was colder. Like I... So... I, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah. Another thing I want to throw to you, you mentioned like storing is that's a huge thing. But here's one that a lot of people don't think of, and mothers are going to hate me for this. Washing your sleeping bag is not overly great. No. Uh, so every time you go camping, if you come home and you throw it in a washing machine to make sure it's as clean as possible for the next trip, uh, then that, especially for things like down, that takes all the down, clumps it together, and then you have to dry and loft it again. You're going to be throwing it in your dryer probably with a whole bunch of tennis balls. You're going to do all kinds of things to get the loft back. It seems to me like you never get quite the same loft out of it again. It takes a lot longer. That sleeping uh, bag so there, I tried doing all those tricks after I heard it from you. I was like, oh, I wonder if my loft will come back. It did not. <laughs> but, and, and I don't advocate being dirty. And honestly, if you're if it gets too dirty, it gets full of oils from your skin and stuff, then you still have the same problem. Mm -hmm. It's going to clump up and get... So everything you can do to protect your sleeping bag when you're using it is extremely important. That's part of the maintenance. It's part of the use. Uh, a sleeping bag liner, it's something that you can throw in the wash and clean every trip or every other trip or whatever is, is, is what's most comfortable for you. That's... A, going to be easier to wash, clean, dry, and it's going to really protect that investment. So you've spent two, three, seven, eight, you know, a thousand dollars on a sleeping bag, depending on what you got and what your, you know, your high investment is. Spending an extra 20 bucks for a liner. Good investment. It's, it's a great investment. Um, I've got a couple. I got a fleece one. I got one that I, I bought off Jeremy. It's, it's much smaller and light. It's, it takes up less room in my fist and my, uh, in my backpack. So, Things like that, uh, you know, makes makes a big difference. Uh, protects your gear. And like you said, that can just be thrown in the washer. I was reading up on my sleeping bag. Do not wash. Do not dry clean. The only way to clean that bag is a damp cloth. And yeah. wipe it. So, I mean, you, yeah. you can imagine what that's going to take to wipe the entire inside of that sleeping bag and let it dry again. So, you know what old Roberto got himself? Bag liner. <laughs> bag liner. Yeah, uh, it's that's a simple thing. Uh, how you sleep in the woods, it, it, it varies for everyone. I mean, there's there's an old saying out there that sleeping naked uh, is one of the warmest ways because it's skin to skin and all that. Uh, but then other people say that 
not really a great idea. Um, it looks like you hadn't heard that one before. Nope, first for me, but I mean, you're saying skin to skin, so I'm wondering, are you alone in your sleeping bag? Did you bring a buddy? <laughs> anyway, different camp? topic oh. with a different rating. <laughs> Robert, we're going to go camping. <laughs> We've been camping, uh, Ben. No. <laughs> Anyway. You your own right it's it's keeping it's, it's the difference between putting your, your hands in a in a mitt and gloves gloves are colder mm. than mitts right that's the type of thing yeah you so allowing. you're trapping your own insulation I, I get the idea it just hit me wrong when i first thought of it I'm like, right. hmm. but uh, uh i started to use more like thin long johns things like that something that's fairly packable in addition to my liner all these things do add a degree of warmth uh, and, and, and it's, it's all part of my overall system and everything has, you know, ease of maintenance to protecting the sleeping bag, which is the most expensive piece of kit and hardest to maintain. So if I can keep that as clean and as dry as possible, that saves me a lot of time and effort later. Um, no, Chris, uh -oh. that's not on the next episode. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We're not including that. <laughs> Um, yeah, no. I go back to the comments. <laughs> it's not bad, but, uh, no, and then that's, the, you hit the nail right on the head. A bag liner, all those little things, they add a little bit of extra warmth, and they save you a lot of time down the road, and it'll save your gear a long time down the road. So proper maintenance is important. Uh, yeah. it's easily overlooked, or it's easily, oh, I'll get to it, whatever that's called, procrastinated, but you know what? It, it's worth just taking a few minutes when you come home, at least tear everything out and let some air get to it. Bottom line, like yeah. it, the worst thing you can do is leave everything jammed in your backpack, and we are all guilty for it. Uh, after you know, one, two, three, seven days in the woods, you land home, you're tired. You just you know, oh, there's my couch, my TV, things are nice again, and you have a tendency to try to unwind or decompress or whatever it is. But I mean, I go to the woods to do that, but a lot of people come in and they just want to chill for a little bit, and everything gets knocked to the back burner. The reality is for me anyway, is as soon as I land in, I start unpacking my bag. At least get it out and put it on the floor of my office in here because then I have no choice. I have to come back to it. Because if yep. I just leave it in the bag and set the bag in here and go, oh, I'll get to it, that bag just keeps getting further and further and further against the back wall until it's no longer seen. Yeah. You see to have every intention to come in and do something with it and then two, three hours later not and then you know, someone calls or visits, and next thing you know, I'll deal with that in the morning. It should be okay till then, right? And then the next day comes along, and now it's a week, and you go down, and you've got gear that's moldy and rusting and uh, starting to rot, and you've lost it. Like, you, you, you'll lose some of your gear if you do that. So taking those extra few minutes, planning that into your trip, it's it really should be part of your trip plan. If you're coming home, if you're going for a weekend and you're coming home at eight nine o'clock on sunday night and got work five o'clock the next morning chance there you don't have time you, you haven't given yourself enough time to pull your gear out make sure it's clean and dry at the very least like you say make sure it's, it's airing out so that when you do have a chance to deal deal with it in greater effect you can um coil up your knives check check your leather Take any dirty clothing and get it in the laundry or at least in the laundry pile. Uh, all these things are part of it. Um, some of us have gear that we only wear really when we're in the woods. So th it could, if you didn't deal with it right away, it could end up being your pack for a while. And you think, oh, it's fine, but it may not be. Uh, so take yeah, that time. And the worst place you can keep anything's in your pack. Uh, I did have two comments I wanted to bring up, Ben. I did not mean to cut you off, but they're still relevant uh -huh. at the moment. So Chris's first comment, and this is prime example of why you should uh, unpack your bag a little bit. Uh, he just took his bag out of the car before the storm they had, and apparently he yep. left some eggs in it. Oh, no. So, I mean, like, the, the, the prime candidate right there. At least it's winter, it's cold, they probably didn't do it. Well, they might have frozen burst. Uh, I hope not. But anyway, prime candidate. You never know what you just accidentally forgot. Like, I took our bag, or the bag from when you and I were out, uh, to dig some of the stuff out here for examples, and I noticed I had left uh, one of my food satchels in there, which is just a bag of oatmeal and some dried rice, so no big, no harm, no foul. But, I mean, still, 
I didn't realize that was in there. That could have been something worse, like eggs. <laughs> and mine stored inside, so it would have been bad. But prime example. And um, the other one was Gary said his sleeping bag tent and tarps get hung first thing in return when, and the rest can wait a little bit. And you know what? Bottom line, that's probably a great spot to be. If you can at least get your sleeping bag up, your tents and your tarps, that's your main system, your high cost stuff, your important things starting to be dried and maintained. Um, you're, you're well ahead of the curve already. Yep. No, and, and I think that's what we're saying in the end. That is what we're saying is if you're going out for be it a night, a week, and when you get back, take that few minutes, get your gear out, make sure it's drying off, uh, make sure it's put away. Otherwise, uh, you know, you, you could end up with damage or just, uh, dirty gear and when you go to use it it's, it's a disappointment it, it, at the very least it's it's costly at the worst um yeah because the other end of that is when you know better and you know you know better when you find something you just feel terrible stupid. yeah you just feel ridiculous you're like ah oh, i should have done I, x y z yep and no. it, it's a, it's a gut wrenching feeling, especially like uh, a sleeping bag or something like that. Like I know better now. I shouldn't have been storing this in a stuff sack. And I mean, it's not a high cost sleeping bag, but it was a nice little sleeping bag. I enjoyed it. And now it's pretty much restricted to the middle of the summer. Uh, and it just it the list goes on for examples like that. Uh, Think out the help. Buddy of mine got sidetracked after checking his slips one day, and found out it's how. Quick... Oh, okay. I, I wasn't familiar with the term slips. That must be new finese, is it? Oh, probably. Very <laughs> uh, perfect sense to me. <laughs> okay. One day and found out how quickly grouse can stink up a house when he left. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it it's real easy ways to get sidetracked and. It doesn't take much is the bottom line. So we have covered the sleep system, cutting tools, leather, uh, trying to drag us a little bit back on here. The last thing I want to talk about, Ben, you may have a few more points here, but um, was clothing. And this more applies for during the summer and stuff like that. And there is kind of some maintenance or after camping prep that you should do with some of your, your clothing, especially if you're going out around where ticks could be. And as we know, Nova Scotia is polluted in ticks now. Uh, Chris, I think you're still good over on the rock. I don't think they have a tick for their name over there yet, but over here. Um, um, West Coast has some now. Ew, uh, that sucks. Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, so ticks, any real creepy crawlies, bug stuff like that. So when I get home, I generally take all my clothing that, uh, was in my bag, my dirty clothes straight in the washer. Uh, what I'm wearing will be stripped off. I go straight to the bathroom, do a tick check. That's just uh, old habit from my old job. Every day I got home, I had to do one. So it's, I'm pretty quick at it now. Um, and then take the clothes I'm wearing, go straight in the washer and it goes on hot and I just yeah. let everything wash. Uh, I run it through the dryer, make sure everything's good hot. and dry, hot, and then I will take all that stuff out and then just give it a visual check. Make sure there's no bugs or anything like that on it. Because I have had ticks crawl out of the dryer before, uh, and I don't want Melissa seeing any of that because she'll freak out. But uh, ticks are incredibly resilient, right? So you have to be on par for them. And that's the thing. If they just kind of fall off your clothes and stuff like that, they can wander around your house and attach to less likely you. Uh, because in a house, it's not really the ideal environment for them. It's possible, just not yeah. likely, but pets, uh, pets yeah. tend to lay in the floor, stuff like that. They'll sneak up and now your pet has a tick on them. You know what I mean? So, it, or a kid, anything like that, <laughs> anything that's relatively close to the floor. Cause ticks, they're uh, opportunistic predators. If you want to call them that they basically hang on a blade of grass with their back legs dangling out. They've got hooks on them and they just hook onto anything that walks by. They don't actively try and jump on things or you know, launch at a trees or anything like that. That's kind of a tiny misconception. They, they're opportunistic. Something has to brush by them. Like when we used to do mass tick collections, you basically took an old sheet and drug it through the, through the grass and you'd pull it up and that's how you got your tick samples. Right. But uh, uh -huh. not to say they can't fall on your head at a trees and stuff like that. Like they're not the most intelligent animal. They may not have been purposely trying to jump on you, but they do just fall at a trees and there's a lot of them and that can land on you. So there's all 
all kinds of opportunities for bugs. So long story short, check your clothing when you get home. Uh, and that way, any significant others, children, pets, stuff like that, you're just kind of doing the, the proper procedure to keep them, I don't want to say safer, because a bug's not going to eat them, but it's just less stress on everybody. Yeah, um, as with all your gear, like give anything you have, give it a once over, make sure that it's it's still functioning the way it should. Uh, guidelines and stuff, make sure there's no chafing or rips, tears, great cracks, breaks, whatever, on any of your gear. Uh, and if there's something that has worn to the point where it's probably no longer going to function, don't even bother taking it the woods anymore. Replace it when you notice it. Uh, finding out last minute, like if you have a small crack in, in your knife because you've been batoning the hell out of it for weeks and weeks, all of a sudden you notice a small crack in the back, it's probably a good time to replace it when you notice it. Because once you, you've noticed it, it's probably not going to last a lot longer. No, um, and that tends to be the way it goes. If you didn't notice it, last your lifetime. You notice it and you think, ah, oh, it's not bad, broke tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so take take a few minutes, go over your gear, and make sure that if there's anything wrong with it, you you, you deal with it when you, you see it, and you'll tend to have a lot less problems in the future with it. You'll, you'll And uh, you know what you have, because, again, uh, the end result is when you're out there, you're in the woods, you're enjoying yourself, you are isolated from the rest of the world. You can't just simply replace everything. There's plenty of stuff you can make out there, and I think that's a huge part of this bushcrafting thing we're doing. Uh, a lot of gear that we take, we can make, and that's great, but only if the gear we take is working and is functional. Uh, I depend highly on my knife. I, I could make my fork knife, or not knife, but I could make, well, I can for like spreading butter and, and minor stuff. Mm. But yeah, I can make utensils, I can make tent pegs, I can make shelter and all that if I have a good sharp knife or a good good axe or whatever. But if I don't have that equipment, if that fails to me, if I go out with an axe with the loose head and next thing you know it flies off, it's much harder to continue on. It's going to affect your trip. Uh, can you make a wedge in the woods? Probably. But if the head breaks off, I'm, not, I'm personally not going to make a new axe head or handle in the woods. It's just not going to happen. I'm not that good of it in my garage when I have all the tools. Well, I've spent an hour or two trying to get the, an old handle out of the head of an axe because it's wedged in there so good and it broke off just below the head. Uh, trying to do it in the woods with no proper tools, it's going to be a lot harder. I'm not saying people can't do it. I'm not saying it hasn't been done. but uh, It's just more difficult you, and takes away from your enjoyment. If you're going into woods, check your gear before you leave. Make sure everything's in working order. Make sure that it, any problems are dealt with. And uh, I think you're going to have a much better trip. You're going to be more prepared. And it's just good practice. Uh, the other things that fall along the same lines, make sure you got fresh batteries in any devices you're taking out. Uh, if you've been going with the same headlamp for the last three months, good chance are, is that that battery's getting pretty weak and you're going to go dead. Uh, same thing with GPSs, anything like that. Make sure you have good fresh batteries. Make sure you have spares. Make sure your spares are good. Check their, their levels if you have a battery checker. Um, and so on and so forth. Just take that time to check everything. Make sure you have your backups where you need them. And uh, yeah, I think if you've done that, then you've taken a huge step to uh, ensuring a successful trip. I 100% agree. And I know it all sounds like pretty common sense stuff, but somebody once said there's no such thing as common sense, only acquired knowledge. So if you don't know what you don't know, then you don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, I mean, maintenance really is important, guys. Anybody out there listening, watching, doesn't matter. It's tedious, yes, but so is showering, but it's necessary. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just one of those things you'll feel better when it's all done. Yeah, I know, Ben, that was a hint. <laughs> no, but it's one of those things. Like, I mean, yeah, so, some people love to shower, but it's just one of those things. You just make the time to do it because you need to do it, and it'll everything will be better after it's done, and that's kind of where it sits in. A little bit of maintenance goes a long way. A pound, An ounce of cure is better than a... No, sorry, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. That's the other one I was yeah. trying to look for. Um, yeah. 
And yeah, and that that's basically what it boils down to. It's we're all guilty for being a little neglectful off it. We've said that multiple times, so don't beat yourself up over it. But try yeah. to be cognitively aware of it and set yourself up for success. So on your way home, just maybe be like, all right, first thing I'm going to do when I get home is I'm just going to pull everything out of the bag and put it on the floor. At least then you have to trip over it and you're going to be less likely to jam it in a back corner. Okay, as soon as I get home, at least I'm going to, you know, unroll my sleeping bag and my tent and all that and put it on the lawn because it's a nice day and let it dry. Like, even just little things. It doesn't have to be this big, long, drawn-out process. Okay, I'm going to pull everything out of my kit bag. I'm going to inventory it. I'm going to meticulously scrutinize it. I mean... That would be awesome, don't get me wrong, but a little unrealistic. So hit the important ones, come back for the other stuff, and just, there's always generally an ongoing upkeep in my office, if that makes any sense. Everything is set up for long-term storage, but nothing really stays long-term storage in my office, because I'll just be walking by and be like, oh, I haven't seen those knives in a little while. And I'll pop them out, make sure they're sharp, make sure that they're not tarnishing, corroding touch up of oil, make sure everything's still good. Like, it, it's just kind of an ongoing process. And uh, once you get to that level of being in the woods and really enjoying it, it kind of comes naturally. Yeah, and I try to cycle my gear through a lot. So, you know, this time I'll take this hammock, that time I'll take that one, this time I'll take a tent, this time I'll take that, this time I'll take this knife. That means that all of it gets a chance to be out. I know what the state of the mall is. But if you don't, if you're always taking the same gear, but you have spare gear and you think, oh, that spare gear is good, it may come to when you pull it out that it's been sitting in a, in a basement that's maybe not as dry as it should be. Uh, and it has suffered some degree of damage over that time. So taking it out, checking it over, making sure leather can dry out, whether it's being used or not, things like that. It's a good idea to check it off. Um but I think we've we've beaten this horse. <laughs> I think so. We're coming up on an hour, and we did repeat a lot of stuff, and I apologize to anybody that's got their eyes rolling back of their head going, oh, my God, you already said that. It, once again, minute stuff, all important. So I think that's a good time to end it there. As uh, Ben said, uh, for those of you that are watching us on Facebook, not Facebook anymore, YouTube. <laughs> I got to get with the time spent. Anybody anyway, that's watching us on YouTube, uh, if you're new to us and you want to check out the rest of the podcast instead of going back and watching all the videos, if you want to, that's amazing. Awesome. Thank you. But if you want to like download the audio to take in your car or to the gym or something like that, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Music, Shoutbox, Shoutcast, basically any podcasting service. Just search for Atlantic Bushcraft, Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Uh, you can jump on our website at atlanticbushcraft.ca. It'll link you to all the past episodes. Uh, it'll also give you all our other forms of media there. If you can check us out on Facebook, uh, I'm trying to think here, Twitter, Instagram, basically all social medias, all that good stuff. And now if you're on the other side of the coin and you're listening to us only, be sure to check all that stuff and actually get to see our marvelous faces and smiling physiques <laughs> and check out the rest of our videos because we do more than just the podcast there are some how to's there's some reviews information videos some other stuff on our channel a lot of good information there especially if you're getting into bushcraft or if you just want our opinions on some stuff some general knowledge because that's really what we're all about is just trying to expand this out help people enjoy themselves a little bit more get out there have fun get dirty but play safe or you just want to see a couple of fools in the woods, honestly. <laughs> I mean, that's as good a reason as any. I was trying to high class this bed, and you drug us back down to reality, man. That's that's all I'm really here for is to keep keep you on the level, <laughs> and properly so. But uh, yeah, so either way, check us out on whatever you're not listening or watching us on, and everybody have fun. Get out there, try some stuff. Uh, just be safe about it. We all want you to come back and see our next episodes. I, I definitely know I'm getting out this weekend. I hope you get out too soon. I hope, but uh, we'll see. I think family's coming down now, but I still may sneak out. <laughs> if not, I got reviews coming. I have two products I want to review, so both are sharpening related. Look for those in the future. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.